world is changing at a rate that we've never seen before. From business to art to sports, these changes are affecting every aspect of our lives. My name is Nick Kastner, and we're setting out to talk with the people who are altering the way things are done. Along with Alec McChesney, this is The Commonwealth. Our guest today is John Rood, Senior Vice President of Disney and a friend of the, the show from a very early stage. Uh, John helped us come up with the name, and um, you've given us a few uh, few guest suggestions. So, John, thanks for uh, finally sitting down with me. To well, chat. thank you. Yeah, I, we negotiated a, a reasonable speaker fee, so I'm happy, <laughs> yeah. happy to be here finally. Yes. I'm, I'm so proud of what Commonwealth has become, and I'm glad to have my little place in it, a little part of it. Yes, yeah. So um, if you would explain the name. Sure. And, yeah, yeah. So a, a local media org here, uh, their original name was Commonwealth. And I always found that a very cool dichotomy of a name. It's almost an oxymoron, right? That mm-hmm. wealth is usually for the privileged few. And I I know a few states in the East have were originally defined as Commonwealth, but there's nothing really that distinguishes a Commonwealth versus a state. But the yeah. name has always stuck with me and it's got a rich and varied history across Nebraska. And so when you were talking about trying to talk about excellence or talk about um, achievement at mm-hmm. any type of uh, citizenry, I just thought Commonwealth was a cool idea. Yeah, well, thank you for the name. I appreciate it. Yeah. We, we've obviously doubled down on it. So. Yeah, you have. And yeah. That, to your credit, again, you declared that this is something you wanted to go after, and your guest list, uh, present company excluded, <laughs> your guest list has been amazing and so diverse. And that's what I celebrate about Nebraska. So the fact that you're delivering on it with the varied stories that you've told, I appreciate. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So um, to start with, we, um, I have known known who you are and have known your career for for a while now. But um, if you could give us a sense on what the senior vice president of Disney actually does, sure, I- I'm I'm interested. Well, there's 200,000 of us, so as you can imagine, there's a lot of uh, senior vice presidents at Disney. Okay. My particular area is uh, kids' television, and further, it's marketing. So okay. we're trying to get kids 2 to 11 all around the world to watch our TV content. And now, of course, we have to take it off traditional airwaves and traditional cable and satellite and bring it to them where they are with, this, with the help of the Disney Plus app most recently launched. Mm-hmm. And so I run a team of 100 that tries to tell stories about stories. We're given this this great content like series and movies, and we have to turn it into promotional materials that gets those kids interested in consuming. Okay, so it's um, it's specifically younger kids, sounds like, yeah. and and then. Do you oversee marketing on all all the different channels from social media to digital? Yeah, so we um, we have to bring a mixed economy to kids anymore. It's not enough just to have this channel. Not too long ago, that was enough. The kids were a captive audience. All kids were TV watchers, and all TV watchers were cable watchers, and it was just us and Nickelodeon. Mm-hmm. Now we're fighting Nickelodeon for a two rating because of the hyper competition and the chance that kids are vaping or on (laughs) on YouTube or doing just about everything but watching Disney television. So we're trying to go where they're at, which means we have a robust social cadence and and strategy. And we have to fish where they are with uh, compelling engagement marketing like activations and events and Disney magic anywhere we think those kids likely to watch our stuff are at. So I run a team that does traditional creative like on-air promotion and audiovisual to print design, to television production, to a whole lot of social outreach because we're trying to be where they're at. Yes, of course. How did you get started in this? So I uh, am a Lincoln uh, graduate in the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, in 1987. And I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew it was going to require communication. So I was a communications major with an mm-hmm. English minor. And mm-hmm. I thought maybe I'd go into law school. And then I got led to business school. At business school at the University of Texas, Austin, I just liked my marketing classes more than any of the others. I had an aversion to accounting and an aversion to finance, and I just thought marketing was really something interesting. And then within marketing, advertising was compelling to me. There was no advertising curriculum, and I had taken some advertising in undergrad, but I just thought it was kind of cool. There were shows like 30-something and Bewitched, which your listener has no idea about. But these are old TV shows that glamorized the world of advertising before Mad Men did. But Mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty damn cool. I was afraid of New York, so I chose Chicago as maybe being a third less murderous than New York. (laughs) Armed with my MBA from the University of Texas, I took a job at Leo Burnett Advertising in Chicago. 
Okay. And we got to work on really cool ad campaigns for Miller Beer and McDonald's Burgers. And it was then that I took my first business trip to California. I was 26 before I ever got to California. And driving past those studio gates, I was like, damn, I got to get a job pushing a broom. I don't care what it is, Paramount or Warner or anyone with these cool studio locations. And I'll get it out of my system and return to Chicago. Mm-hmm. Well, that was 25 years ago. Yeah. I, I went to L.A. and I haven't looked back. And it's been a great career within studio marketing. I started in consumer products and made my way over to television and brand marketing. Mm-hmm. And so I've done 10 years at Warner Brothers and 14 years at Disney now in total. Yeah. So um, to start with, was uh, was working in an ad agency, was it as sexy as you, as you thought it was? It was the last days of that Mad Men kind of nonsense. We mm-hmm. Because at the time I had Dewar Scotch as a client and then I had Miller Beer as a client, we were definitely – consuming our client product uh, during the work day and work week. And Chicago was a crazy fun time. Mm-hmm. So it was definitely that old school day of uh, we also had Marlboro cigarettes as a client. So it was every bit the debauchery you might picture of urban advertising at, at a high level. But it was a great boot camp for me. The Burnett system of learning a strategy to convince that, which was, again, to convince a certain audience that you should use this good or service because is is this kind of template for strategy and we learned and learned and learned and it was a, a wonderful place to get the core essence of marketing while being in a great town at a great time mm-hmm. how much was uh, how much different was it moving to the uh, to the studio and entertainment world yeah it was pretty different uh, for one they not a lot of socializing going on in LA in Chicago or at least among my Chicago friends we were out every night mm-hmm. and you could walk around to things in Chicago so you get out to LA and I was like Hey, and who, where's everyone going after work? And they looked at me suspiciously. One of the reasons was proximity. Again, she lives over by the beach, and this guy lives up in the valley, and so no one wants to stay and drink after a day of work or something. But I also noticed there was just a suspicion associated with so, socializing that really threw me off. Here's my theory. East Coast is all about the past tense. Where'd your parents go to prep school? Hey, I'm an Italian. Oh, yeah, we've ever been to Italy? No, man, but I'm an Italian. Midwest... Here we are. It's all mm-hmm. about the present tense. Hang in there. Friday's coming. Work ethic. Identify the commonwealth. Support one another. Okay. And so socializing was just what one did with their various tribes. There was a Nebraska bar or a Chicago Bears bar or mm-hmm. an advertising bar or whatever. God, I sound like an alcoholic. On <laughs> yeah. And then the West, but the West Coast is all about the future tense. And I'm not really a barista. I'm a cinematographer. Or It's not what have you done for me lately in L.A. It's what can you do for me tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So when I was expecting to socialize, once I got to town, everyone was suspicious. And again, because they only are working this angle about what is it you're going to do or what can you do for me. And out here in the Midwest, they don't ask you first and foremost what it is you do. It's about the third thing that they get to. But in L.A., the currency is what do you do for a living? And because I have low self-esteem, I needed to work at Disney or Warner Brothers or some <laughs> brand that they've heard of. Mm-hmm. So, um, being a studio guy, uh, you've al- you've always been marketing the the stories that that you're given, correct? Yeah. So, so as far as what the story is, there, your team doesn't doesn't dictate that much, correct? Well, we th- it depends. You you get a good relationship going with creators and, mm-hmm. and with the current and development departments that create that television. So, if you're a good marketer, you're partnered with research, and you are helping at least identify what kind of audience there's going to be for what type of programming. And then the programming department says to studios and agencies and creators, hey, we need this type of comedy or we need to target this type of child or we need this type of event programming or whatever. So marketing is in the mix sooner than usual. Yeah. Some studios, yeah, they wait till the film's in the can and then say go market it, which is not advantageous, but I've dealt with both types of regimes. Again, okay. some that involve us from the outset. And then some that say, now, okay, now that it's done, we have to, let's figure out who it's for or how to publicize and market it, which is a dangerous path. Yeah. How, what's your strategy to working with with, uh, with the creators to yeah. – Sure. Yeah, to, to make sure you're on the same page. And, well, that's and just it. They, they have given their uh, blood, sweat, and tears into the printed page, and they've, mm-hmm. and they've labored over this project forever. And they're very suspicious of – other people coming and trying to take pieces of their 
energy from them, right? So they'll clear, they'll cash our checks, but they don't like it when we say, hey, here's how we think our audience is going to want to consume this. So we have some big egos. I've just tried to be humble. Mm -hmm. I think my Midwest charm, dare I say, has helped disarm some of these uh, heady people that and just said, look, I'm on your side. I'm not trying to screw with your baby here. I'm just trying to get it in as many households as possible. Help me help you. And I'll try to do it with ears wide open. Just say, when you created this, what? who are you thinking this was going to be for? Or fans of blank might want to watch this and let them dictate some of that. Mm -hmm. And then you do a little bit of demonstration that you are the experts here and you're going to have them advise how you market this, but you're not going to have them dictate how we market it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So your first role in entertainment was at Warner Brothers, and you were there for six and a half years? Yeah. Correct? So it was in consumer products, and it was the heyday of licensing. Um, okay. There were 190 studio stores for Warner Brothers around the country. Now there is one. So many of the listeners may not remember that there was a time where it was an experience to go to mall retail and get a piece of Hollywood, whether it's a... Batman shirt or a Looney Tunes necktie or Friends coffee mug or whatever it was that we were merchandising. And then I did a lot of tie-ins with national advertisers per my experience at uh, advertising in Chicago. So we did Michael Jordan ads for McDonald's when I was at Burnett in Chicago. We did Michael Jordan ads when I was at Warner Brothers for Space Jam and other types of uh, promotional things. We do Happy Meals and do Super Bowl ads and the whole bit. It was a really high profile time when a lot of advertisers wanted Disney and Warner Brothers intellectual property to borrow. Okay. And then, so you ended up leaving Warner Brothers and took a job as uh, the senior vice president for ABC Family? Well, correct? before that, a VP at Disney Channel. So I had, okay, I had okay. a 10 year Sorry, stretch. First stretch at Disney was, been, was over 10 years from 2000 to 2010. And it was to do marketing for Disney Channel. And Disney Channel was very uncool at the time. Okay. Uh, Nick and Cartoon Network were doing better numbers. And I had only been in town about six, seven years, but I wasn't quite certain about these Disney people down the, hall, down the street from us. They mm -hmm. seemed very cocky. They seemed very drinking their own Kool-Aid and all about their brand. Okay. And the Disney Channel people that hired me said, no, no, we're former Fox people. We're former Nickelodeon people. We are literally and figuratively removed from the, from the lot. Our office building was a couple blocks away. And so we didn't have to deal with that regime and that cockiness. We could kind of do our own thing as a channel trying to become relevant. So I liked how it was a little bit more pirate ship than it was British Navy. But it was Disney, so that brand name meant that people would return our phone calls. And it was just awesome to be in at the ground level of them saying, we got to take this generic, boring cable channel and make it relevant with original programming and High School Musical and Hannah Montana, and mm -hmm. the, we, Disney Channel rose in prominence, and I was fun to be around during that. Yeah, yes. So then I transitioned from Disney Channel over to the ABC Family Channel. Okay. We had acquired it from Fox, and that's so funny because 20 years later, here we are having acquired much of Fox mm -hmm. uh, earlier in the year, but Fox Family was sold to Disney, and so we called it ABC Family. Okay. And we were forced to ask ourselves, should we keep the F word? Does it have to be a family channel? Is that a cool thing or an uncool thing? And we faced that challenge of what to do with this family channel. And it was fun to be in at the ground level of that. Yes, yes. So while um, while leading the ABC Family uh, ABC Family Channel, you led a revamp that um, that allowed the uh, allowed the content to attract a much larger millennial millennial market and it um it was very successful um causing the channel to be um so it was it was out of the top 10 before you took over and then it was number one with females between ages 18 to 34 right so yeah. before the days of app and personally setting up your own viewing behavior cable channels had to become niche there were generic mm -hmm. channels like usa or tnt but then the others had to stand for something our family channel was kind of neither and then again, with research, we understood that this audience we were going after, born 77 to 96, the quote-unquote millennials, mm -hmm. we understood from a lot of research that they decision-make by consensus, they multitask, they seek relevance in their media, and they value their families. These are four things that distinguish them from Gen X or from baby boomers. So when we saw that F word on the research, we're like, hey, maybe we shouldn't run toward, 
towards the CW or the WB or the other kind of trendy programming, Mm -hmm. but rather use some of that acquired programming to make family relevant to them. The tagline for ABC Family when it went from out of the top ten into number one was a new kind of family. We were understanding that we weren't talking about mom and dad, and they weren't necessarily white, and they weren't necessarily sophisticated. We wanted to speak to the tribe that you chose and and friendships and other ways to define family. And so the acquired programming of Gilmore Girls, Seventh Heaven, and Smallville, plus the original programming like Secret Life of the American Teenager or Pretty Little Liars, was how we helped define what family meant. Yeah, what did you learn while while leading this change in the in the organization? Is to really not bring your preconceived notions into this debate. Mm-hmm. So I thought family was uncool too, and I couldn't wait to unbrand it and call it something other than family. But if you stopped and understood what the assignment was, and again listened better than most by talking to a lot of millennial females in the case of this research. Then you could be led to a truth born of what the consumer wants versus what you think the consumer wants. Now, you don't want to let research dictate everything. If we had a focus group named Nike, they would probably call it performance tech, right? Mm -hmm. Or if we had a focus group named Starbucks, they'd probably call it, you know, roast home or something stupid, Mm -hmm. right? So so we can't – we want to listen to consumers, not to have them guide everything we do, but certainly advise us on are we doing the right thing? And so – The ABC Family Grand Experiment helped me realize that you don't always know what's best for the consumer. Sometimes they'll tell you if you ask. Yeah. Did you run into an issue with with old school team members not wanting to to change? Yeah. Yeah. This is tough at a big company, right, who's trying to redefine what it wants to be. Mm -hmm. We've got way too many people at Disney as we had way too many people at Warner Brothers who say, well, we tried that back in 08 or – no, it, we've done it this way, and it's always worked. Well, they're they're failing to understand that the sky is falling. In the case of cable, we've got declining ratings, and our business model isn't as robust as it used to be. So we have to, again, take nothing for granted, throw out a lot of the legacy thinking, throw out a lot of the legacy behavior, and occasionally throw out a lot of the legacy employees that aren't up for trying something new. Mm, okay. The good news is Disney's got a lot of lifelong, loyal cast members. The bad news is Disney's got a whole lot of lifelong loyal cast members and you have Mm -hmm. to discern who's up for innovation and who's up for trying new things versus who's just here because it's comfortable. Yeah. And how how do you go about assessing that? Yeah, it's a good question. The leaders have to be as clear as possible for what they think success looks like. They also have to embrace change and celebrate innovation as necessary steps towards a new kind of relevance versus something we're afraid to try. So controlled blasts, or in other words, an isolated place where great risk is allowed to see what comes of it is the best kind of culture for innovation versus saying, oh, we better not try that because we tried it once before, or we better not try that because we've never been known for doing something like that. Hmm. So how do you find folks that are willing to play in a bureaucracy of a large corporation but still have the passion and, and... innovation imperative of a startup. Hmm. Interesting. So after your um, your work at ABC Family, you went t- uh, and took a position as the executive vice president of DC Comics? Yeah, correct? back at Warner Brothers. So I, I don't advise this for everyone, but zigging and zagging, I've had three tours at Warner, two tours at Disney has been the best way for me to find new opportunity. Mm-hmm. In the case of DC Comics, my friend Diane Nelson, she was the wonderful architect of the Harry Potter franchise at Warner Brothers. And they gave her the keys to a very important set of intellectual property, the DC Comics characters, Mm -hmm. Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman. In a studio culture that does not do synergy, they don't like cooperating. They don't like being told what to do. It's every division for themselves, TV versus theatrical versus consumer products versus digital. And this was at Warner. Warner. It's very Mm anti-Disney. Mm-hmm. But having worked at uh, Warner Brothers for several years prior, I guess I knew what I was walking into, and I was able to tell my friend Diane, yeah, I'm willing to go try this to do sales, marketing, and biz dev for this startup idea. Could a DC Entertainment be a studio-wide idea and have all the divisions get behind Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman? It's kind of obvious now because since then, Disney has acquired Marvel, and Marvel's gotten the last laugh at the box office. Mm -hmm. But back then, they weren't so sure that 
guys running around their underwear was a good business model for their respective divisions. And I had to help convince a lot of Time Warner that that was important. We went from zero to 12 television scripts in development, which became great shows like Gotham and Arrow. Mm -hmm. And we got out of this narrow definition of Warner Brothers DC theatrical that had just been Christopher Nolan movies or just been Zack Snyder movies. We continued a great momentum at consumer products and interactive entertainment for the Arkham video game franchise and a lot of other cool stuff. So it was very satisfying five years of encouraging these divisions to use our intellectual property that Warner owned. Marketing is getting work out of people who don't report to you. And so this was mm -hmm. marketing with a capital M. Yeah. So the uh, the Christopher Nolan Batman movies were made before you had this role, correct? One was and one wasn't. The um, Warner Brothers historically, since the gangster and westerns that they used to do back in the 30s, had given a lot of import to their directors, the, the auteur theory, it's called, wherein you have to cede everything to this singular vision. And so in the case of a lot of the DC Comics movies, they didn't have a shared narrative with the comics, or they weren't as widely embraced by all ages as they could be, certainly versus Marvel, when we made such a singular choice to get behind an adult storyteller like a Christopher Nolan or a Zack Snyder. Mm -hmm. So you got great performances out of Heath Ledger as the Joker, but yeah. maybe you didn't sell a lot of Joker merchandise. Yeah. Not that I was trying to commercialize everything, but from where I was, I saw what Marvel and Disney were about to do, saying you can do both. And Disney doesn't put quite as much total power and authority onto the director. It's part of a larger machine that includes the great visionary of a Kevin Feige or the great merchandising and marketing arm of Disney Studios instead of just making it all in for the director. Yeah. Now, I wasn't in on the Christopher Nolan negotiations directly, but yeah. it was good to see us diversify to other types of stories and other types of storytellers and an understanding that we're a studio that's also trying to do television content and sell home video to as many people as possible. And we shouldn't necessarily do narrow adult storytelling exclusively. Yeah. So once you had that, that DC the DCB properties and you were, you were tasked with taking them to each the, the, the theater division and the television division. Um, how, what does that pitch process look like? Yeah. That's, and again, at Warner brothers, culturally, they just weren't so certain that they should trust this external colleague. Mm -hmm. Disney down the street is uh, quite different forever. It has been about kids and family, and it's forever it's been about special entertainment with heart, and it's been about the word synergy, which is, again, bringing two or more divisions together for a greater good. Now, Warner Brothers' success as a stock is almost equal to that of Disney, so you could argue that one business strategy is not better than the other, just wildly different. So at Warner Brothers, it was about, hey, I know you don't have no reason to call me back, or hey, I come in peace. But we have this these properties that the studio owns that we think you should be making more television with or we think we sh you should be making more animation with or more adult movies than just the occasional Dark Knight or whatever it is. Mm. So a lot of persuasion that Diane Nelson led. In the meantime, I was taking a static and declining paper publishing business, seeing the demise of bookstores and comic book shops and trying to bring it into the new with digital publishing. Okay. And with storytelling for all types of readers and not just super duper nerd fans about things mm -hmm. to the question of what's more important to a DC or a Marvel, the fan that knows this narrative and myth so very well and is passionate. And then the non consumer that might be exposed to this new entertainment. The answer is yes, they both matter to us wildly. So how do you balance that service of the super fan with fishing for the new fans? Yeah. And and how do how do you how do you approach balancing that? Well, you know, carrot and stick, right? You, each person requires a different approach to try to get work out of them. And I learned rather the hard way how to approach a division, showing that it's in their best interest to use this property. Hey, mm -hmm. look at all the things that are happening in publishing, or hey, look at all the things that are happening in video games. There, look at all the fanaticism going on at a comic con, and it's not just adult males who live in their basement, their parents' basement or whatever, mm -hmm. right? It was getting broad and it was getting mass and Disney and Marvel were kicking our butt. And so there were a lot of 
data points I could bring to these divisions to say, hey, you should do something with us because when we work together, it actually actually has a larger impact. Yeah. And then you eventually went back to Disney. Yeah. I um, kept friendships up in a way that after my Disney – or excuse me, my Warner assignment kind of ran its course, I was able to return to Disney Channel. And it was an exciting assignment to go back to a channel that was very different – in the five years that I was away, five years away from the building, 10 years away from working on Disney Channel. Mm-hmm. And they had gone again from obscurity to the top of the mountain and kind of back to obscurity because today's kids are on YouTube and today's kids want every kind of story in hyper competition beyond the stuff that Disney says is good for them. And so I liked the assignment. It smells like a lot of the stuff I had done in the past in reinventing Looney Tunes or reinventing the Family Channel or reinventing Disney Channel to do it again, saying, how can we take this legacy brand and bring it into the new? Mm -hmm. So the assignment was too good to pass up. I had done a consulting gig to help them get into short form, which they did not know or care about. We had to show them through data that we need to do something other than the 22-minute four-camera, three-act, two tweens and a dog template that mm-hmm. had served their sitcom machine really well for a long, long time to say, hey, you need unscripted and you need reality and you certainly need something shorter than 22 minutes given the attention span and consumption behavior of today's kids. Yeah. Um, so so that content that you just you just outlined, what um, what did that turn into? Like, is it is, is that content on YouTube or right. is it on, is it distributed through TV? Yeah, or? it's a great question. Both, actually. Okay. The, some of our content is seen as just entertainment for entertainment's sake. And the way we kind of discern whether it's fish or fowl would be like, what do you want a kid to do after watching it? Some of the stuff we make is just entertaining short form, mm-hmm. a series of three minute uh, serialized chapters of a fictional narrative and it's for entertainment's sake and sometimes we'll put it exclusively on youtube to bring the disney brand where they are versus expecting them just to come to cable and or we'll put it on cable in pieces that fit nicely in our programming schedule after a movie to get to the hour or put put together in a standard half hour that they're used to seeing on television so we can use this short form in any number of ways Mm -hmm. The other type of short form, especially the one my department does in earnest, is marketing. Just stories about that new movie or stories about that new Hmm. stage show or stories about that new TV series that becomes, in micro content, social content, or in short form, becomes a YouTube way of getting those brands and faces and properties out there to kids where they are. Yeah. What is your relationship with uh, with YouTube? Because YouTube has captured uh, a large portion of this demographic, correct? Yeah, it is a love-hate relationship, Mm -hmm. probably the best way to look at it. I Just because any knucklehead with a phone can be a storyteller doesn't mean it's become any easier to do compelling stories. Mm -hmm. And we have this quality imperative at Disney, as old as as the studio, that we're going to do special entertainment with heart. And you're going to see it and feel it that this is better than your average content. So it's very hard to compete with the wasteland of garbage that YouTube largely is Mm -hmm. to say that they are a direct competitor per se. They're a necessary place for us to be if we want to be relevant and authentic with kids. But we've had mixed results about bringing YouTube influencers onto our airwaves and vice versa. And so I have to kind of be judged by what I say no to is the Disney brand and stand for the specialness of our storytelling and stand for the quality of our entertainment so we don't feel we have to compete against unboxing videos or compete against eight-hour gaming watch-along videos. Mm -hmm. So podcasting is similar because there's a bunch of podcasts in the world. Uh, Where do you draw the line of what you say no to? Yeah, well, podcasting is fascinating because think about it. We have had a podcast become a narrative TV show in America lately. We've had a Mm -hmm. podcast become a movie. We've had a movie become a podcast. We've had a news piece become a podcast series. So the way that this audio self-generated rebellious and narrow casting medium has blown up and Mm -hmm. affected the media landscape is just staggering on the kid side. It's not quite as clear how to work with it. We have great short form like 
lullaby audios that work well with Spotify or Pandora, right? But we don't, and maybe we'll get to a place where there's good storytelling uh, for the mind's eye or whatever good narrative and fictional podcasts do well. But certainly our colleagues at FX, Freeform, ABC, ABC News, ESPN, they all have a, at least a big toe in podcasting yeah. because that's where their adult audience is. And it's just been a fascinating place to drive narrative. It's yeah. a, a new storytelling. So I saw um, I saw the stats that there's 2 million podcast channels out in the world right now, and there's 20 million YouTube channels. So the assumption that the person was trying to make is podcasting will continue to grow at, um, to the size of YouTube. As, as you assess markets that are growing and, and, and emerging, how – how do you go about making assumptions on the size that it's going to grow to? Yeah, you, it's very hard to predict. You want to create a market before having to follow it and predict it. For example, Under Armour would never have gotten into the business if they listened to their analysts about going up against Nike. Mm -hmm. Or Starbucks defied all logic by saying we would want to drink a $5 coffee. Right? Yeah. So same would be true with a new medium, whether it's, in our case, a new direct-to-consumer app or a whole new storytelling device, in this case, podcasting. It's very hard to monetize or estimate what it can become. It will maybe have its heyday and then fall off again. Mm -hmm. But the fact that in the information age, technology is not a barrier to entry. Back in the day, only TV studios made TV because they had to buy a big camera or a big satellite or a big an antenna. Well, now with your phone, anyone can be a video content driver. And then same is true with a good mic and a good laptop mm -hmm. and some good consumer software to say, I can be an audio storyteller. Hopefully, again, just because there's a lot of guitar players on YouTube and there's a lot of guitar stores, it doesn't make guitar virtuosity any easier. Yeah. So there is a widespread availability of the medium doesn't necessarily mean there's excellence at it and we're just trying to discern the two yeah yeah and how do you specifically with kids content how do you um how do you discern if the if the content is of quality or not yeah the special entertainment with heart it's kind of a cliche but it's actually a pretty good filter for us at disney you see plenty of entertainment art out there that's heartfelt but not particularly special that would be like the ugly dolls movie and okay. then you've got a bunch of content out there that's Special and entertaining, but not necessarily heartfelt, and that's the emoji movie, mm -hmm. right? So, like, there's a lot of pretenders to the throne that at other studios want to try to do that Disney magic. But with very few exceptions, only Disney can be the ones that really deliver that trifecta. Mm -hmm. And so the same is true with a park experience or, dare I say, a social tweet or a, a, an episode of television. We really want to hold to a standard that no one else will hold to. And it, mm -hmm. it's narrowing our audience candidly, but we believe in that because the good brands are judged by what they say no to. Yeah. As, you, as you're narrowing that audience, how do you decide where to narrow it to? Yeah. You just have to do the math saying, are there enough people that want this type of content? And that's right down to, do they want to have a network called Longhorn that's driven by the University of Texas? And ESPN has to decide, is that a good business to go into with their cable and satellite partners? Mm -hmm. Or we have to, with everything we commission for our television, like FX, ABC, Freeform, and Disney Channel, or everything we commission for the new Disney Plus app, exclusive like Mandalorian or High School Musical, we have to get an understanding of who the audience is and then deliver, again, not just driven by what a focus group says, but creators who know this audience and feel like they can bring something special, something entertaining, and something heartfelt all in once to this platform of ours. Yeah. What do you see as the biggest industry challenge for Disney? Well, I guess it would be the, just the proliferation of content and competitors, mm -hmm. both established competitors. Like, again, for Disney Plus's entree into direct-to-consumer app, you have an offering from NBC Universal called Peacock, and you have an offering from AT&T Warner Brothers called HBO Max. And so everyone sees the benefit of going direct-to-consumer with a data-driven singular experience entertainment app. And there's going to be a great competition for storytellers who want to come to Disney instead of coming to Netflix 
or Hulu or Amazon or Peacock or HBO Max. So the buying competition is really strong. Can we, to your question, can we home grow so good storytellers or can we make it compelling to the established storytellers to come over to us and not the other guys for that Disney difference? The other kind of new imperative would be knowing what kids' entertainment is going to be 10 years from now and staying out of the stuff we're not good at, like cheap YouTube videos may not be what we're good at, but can there be a market for what it is we are good at? Well, that's what we're trying to find out daily. Mm-hmm. Daily. Yeah. Um, so Disney Disney Plus recently launched. Six ninety nine, Nick. Yeah, <laughs> that's cheap a month. That's a price of one latte or two, right? Yeah, and actually beforehand, I said I was. I told a friend I was interviewing you, and I guess if you bundle it with Hulu and ESPN, it's only like twelve dollars. Twelve ninety nine. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't know if that's a good idea to price discount and bundle before we even launched the thing. Yeah, this podcast is being recorded five days after we launched, and we have reported ten million subscribers. So. So far, so good. Yeah. Can we keep them? This is our first foray into a direct-to-consumer relationship. We talk about guests a lot, but it's usually an intermediary handling it for us, like Mm -hmm. a travel agent or a theatrical chain owner or a cable company. But now it's just us and our consumer, one at a time, trying to make their experience special, free of glitches, bringing them everything they want so that they never leave us. Yeah, and um, how how do you think that's going to change the content Disney produces? That's a great question. You've got some theatrical producers that are worried that we have no longer have an art house movie business because the movies only have to be Marvel spectacles. We acquired Fox in the spring, and with it came the Fox Searchlight Studios, which has brought amazing titles that have usually win at the Academy Awards. They might have some worry that we have to make stuff that is homogenous or interesting and four quadrant to all ages and uh, all tastes as wide as possible, like a Pixar or Marvel movie. Hmm. I think Bob Iger and the rest of the Disney leadership has been keen to say, we didn't acquire this stuff to take the teeth out of it. We think there's a market that allows for FX's type of storytelling. Maybe it ends up on Hulu instead of Disney+. Plus. Certainly our sports business is robust and successful, and that belongs on ESPN Plus instead of Disney Plus. So there are some pockets of media that are worried, like, again, art house films or high-end television production. But um, we're, we're figuring it out, and we're trying to be where the consumer is with our special entertainment with heart. Again, loosely defined, inclus- inclusive of Free Solo on Nat Geo or ex- mm-hmm. inclusive of 30 for 30 on ESPN or inclusive of American Horror Story on FX and Hulu. So it's not always Disney-branded per se, but it definitely has that Disney quality imperative. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Disney Plus um, attained 10 10 million subscribers in the first 48 hours. Netflix has 100 million subscribers internationally. Is that your direct competitor? And do you have like a marker on the board of we need 100 million subscribers by X date or what? Like, yeah, it's, yeah, a, yeah. it's a great question. I'm not in the room where there's a whiteboard thermometer of fundraising like a, yeah. like one has. But, yeah. uh, by all public reports, it has exceeded our goals so okay. far. I don't think we were ever trying to be the Netflix of Disney because Netflix is a utility that delivers a great tonnage of content. And if you've been on their interface lately, you don't even know where to begin to find something you might like Mm -hmm. among that tonnage. So I like that our app has a more elegant UX that takes you to and through something that you personally want, either from nostalgia or curiosity in some new properties. Netflix doesn't do that. We're never going to have the tonnage they have because we've chosen to showcase the stuff we make mm-hmm. and not just take on all things. Yeah. So they're very successful what they do. But I, in the early days of rumors of Disney Plus, I likened it more to the Amazon of Disney than the Netflix of Disney, wherein you're talking one-on-one to the customer. The customer's historic behavior dictates what you might want to bring to them from the vast array. So as Amazon says, you bought this, you might like that. I think we can do that someday saying... Did you enjoy Moana? Did you know we have a resort in Hawaii called Alani? Mm-hmm. 
you know, right down to the personalization of Nick and what Nick bought before and what Nick watched before. Yeah. Very concerned about privacy issues, but if you tell us or allow us to be told what it is you do and what it is you like, I think we can get smarter and more iterative and serve up the vast array of Disney opportunity to you as a customer, which is not at all what Netflix does. Yeah. Um, so we're currently in an era that the turnover on the Fortune 500 list is um, happening quicker than any other period of time. In the last 20 years, a third of company, a third of the companies have um, have fallen out of the Fortune 500, according to the Kauffman Foundation. How do you think Disney stays innovative in spite of it of its mass size? Yeah, it's an excellent question, and it's only going to get more dynamic. Wherein brands you grow up with are no longer around. Um, and that's just a fascinating movement from the industrial age and fixed distribution channels into the information age where companies come and go. It's fascinating to think that Disney content will, a week from Thursday, be consumed on platforms that haven't even been invented yet. Mm -hmm. Right? So you can either get bummed out by that change imperative or you can embrace it and say, what do we stand for? What do we not stand for? In the case of Disney, unlike Warner Brothers, who's owned by a phone company, and unlike Universal, that's owned by a cable company, we've chosen not to be a soulless utility. We're just going to make train, let others worry about the track. Hmm. Until, of course, we got into the direct-to-consumer business. So it's companies will come and companies will go, but we're entering our 100th year in 2023 for Disney. And its ability to reinvent itself has been about the people that it chooses to employ and the holding to the legacy, not preciously holding on to it like it's run by a ghost, but understanding what truth's universal that can help entertain the globe. Um, I like our chances. Yeah. How do you apply those those uh, tactics to innovate as a leader in the, in the organization? It's not that easy because in one case, we have a bunch of high achievers who have a bunch of ideas. And so it's harder to lead those folks that are passionate about the direction they each want to go into. Additionally, and maybe conversely, you also have folks that like to come to Disney because it is familial and it does feel warm and it does feel safe. Well, warmth and safety and familial feelings is not necessarily uh, good for innovation. So, again, it's an age old question and it's something we face daily, mm -hmm. hourly at Disney. What's baby? What's bathwater? What's worth keeping about our brand legacy and what's worth throwing out and trying anew? Hmm. Interesting. Um, and then, where do you see entertainment going going from here? How how will it continue to uh, continue to evolve? Yeah. Evolve. Well, the evolve uh, evolution is ever about the power of the individual. It is amazing how we have gone from monologue to dialogue. Mm -hmm. In the case of Disney, we used to just have one park, and that was enough. We used to have one hour of television that we decided what's in that hour, and that was enough. We used to have a set number of products at a set number of retailers, and that was enough. Those days are gone. I have made-to-order merchandise through Amazon so that any kid can make near, nearly anything with nearly any of my properties. We have parks and attractions all around the globe because we have to and we need to for a global business imperative. And then certainly our storytelling has to not only be customized and refined and unique to all sorts of need states, it also has to be offered in a way that you can create a Disney viewing experience that's entirely different than mine. Hmm. So the trend will continue towards the power of the individual. It's hard for monolithic companies like mine to understand that and allow that and cede that control to a kid who's now my scheduler and he's now my decider and god maker of what shows are going to work or not hmm. versus us saying this is what we have like it or leave it yeah well john thank you for coming on the show with me today nick thanks so much and and uh, thanks to all the commonwealth listeners that will do it for today's episode thanks for listening we would love for you to subscribe to our channel and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts you can also like the commonwealth on facebook and follow alec and i on linkedin twitter and instagram we release episodes on Mondays, so stay tuned for next week.